I wasn't expecting to see quite so many of you. Um, thank you very much for coming and listening to me talk. Um, so, as he says up there, who I am. Um, Maplin. So, I don't know how much you know about Maplin. Uh, I suspect quite a lot of you will have some, some have had some interaction or some engagement with us. I suspect even more of you will probably have quite a few perceptions of who you think Maplin are as an organisation. But in essence, we are a, a, uh, a, mul a multi-channel retailer. We started life as a catalogue business, um, and those two lovely sci-fi images that you can see up there are some very early catalogues from 1972. Uh, we now we started off in the back of uh, a couple's bedroom where they sent out lots of components, widgets, etc., kind of the, the basics of an electronics business from a, a bedroom in Essex. From that, we've kind of progressed to be 218 stores. We are a web-enabled business. At the moment, home delivery accounts for around about 17, 18% of our, our total sales participation. However, web-enabled, so you know, something such as Send Direct, Click and Collect, Reserve and Collect to Store, accounts for about 25%. However, you would have thought for a technology-based business, that participation would have been higher. Um, we're privately equity owned, we've been owned by Rutland Partners, we've been owned by them since about 2014. Um, we are currently a business in transformation, I'll talk about that a little bit more. However, the thing you may not know about us, and one of the primary reasons for me wanting to join the organisation, is the two numbers that you can see sitting up there. So we currently have a customer satisfaction score of 90, um, and that's driven predominantly from our colleagues, from the in-store experience that you will have with our guys. If you go and have any interaction or engagement with, you, with them, you will see straight away that they are absolutely experts in their field. At no point will you feel like you are being sold something on commission, um, and they work very, very hard to get the right solution for you. Um, so for me as a marketeer, that plus an NPS score, which you can see of 68, is kind of like marketing gold dust. And made us think, actually made me certainly think, if a colleague, your colleagues, front face of your business, are actually your brand ambassadors, how much more can you do? So why am I here today? I've been in Maplin for about 18 months. As a board, when you, we've only been together for 18 months, and we are absolutely a business in transformation. So we are on a journey. Um, and when the brief came through to talk to you guys about omnichannel retailing, I kind of thought that's quite big, it's quite generic. There are lots and lots of things I could tell you about, most of which I suspect you will already know. So what I want to share with you today is the journey that we're on. And we are right at the very beginning of our digital journey. We're right at the very beginning of trying to get our omni-channel puzzle to work together in the way in which we want to. So me being here today, in all honesty, is a shameless PR stunt to talk to you about what we're doing at Maplin. And secondly, to perhaps kind of tell you some of the experiences that we've had as we try to bring multi-channel to life, which just might be relevant for some of the things that you're also going through in your businesses. So, why are we in transformation? And the first thing that's up here is some customer segmentation work that we recently completed. We have been working in the technology industry to a YouGov study that was conducted in 2013, which basically split the market into two key sectors. You were either an expert in technology or you were fundamentally a solution seeker. And Maplin is an organization plus a whole bunch of others had been working to that to try and segment their offer and their proposition. Given how much the market has moved on, we worked out really quickly that that just wasn't granular enough. And so we've spent a lot of time really getting under the skin of how do customers engage with technology and what do they want from it? What are the missions? What are the behaviors? How do they want to make stuff work for them? And we've identified two kind of core sectors. There are experts and there are appreciators. And with an experts, you break it down into either you're a professional or you're an enthusiast, i.e. a hobbyist, or an appreciator, you're someone who just loves technology because you enjoy it. You probably are the first one to have had your Apple Watch and your first one to get your Alexa, you know, your Alexa, uh, Amazon Alexa. You just like talking about it or you're an enhancer. And the majority of people in appreciators are enhancers. And that's because actually they don't really care how stuff works. They just want stuff to be better and easier. And what you can see is the market sectors and then you can see Maplin's penetration. And the challenge for us really is the bit at the bottom, which is that most of our most of our kind of our penetration, if you like, has been in a sector that really, really doesn't require advice. 
These guys absolutely do. And that's the thing that we as a business are fantastic at offering. The second big driver behind us wanting to change our proposition and connected to the customer segmentation piece is this. And I don't know if you can see the stats, you probably can't. But this is an explosion, predicted explosion of the smart home market. So the graph that you can see going that way with the green arrow is a study by IHS which shows you what they expect the connected smart home market to be worth. And the second is a study that was done by Connext, which was about two customers asking, where would you go? If you want to start to find out more about this product and how it works, where's the first place that you'd want to go? Maplin sits at the top, which is great news for us. That then got us thinking about where do we need to go as a brand and how do we make ourselves more relevant to more people at this very kind of critical point in the technology, uh, technology time sphere. So... This is a current Maplin store. I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with it. And this is the inside of a current Maplin store. It doesn't really shout technology innovation. It doesn't shout technology retailer. It certainly doesn't make an omni-channel journey particularly visible to anybody. And if you were thinking smart home and you walked in here, I suspect quite a lot of you would have an allergic reaction to it, particularly if you sit, I can see lots of nods, if particularly if you sit in the appreciator segment. So. We built a brief. Our brief was about brand transformation, brand proposition, brand reappraisal of our, our kind of our, you know, what is it that Maplin effectively offers. So we've been working with a company called 2020 to basically transform our stores. And the brief was really simple. Two key missions, discover and dwell. Second one was find and get. At the moment, most people who come into a Maplin store through that or come into a, our, our web offering are on a find and get mission. They know exactly what they're looking for. Don't touch the sides of anything else. Come in, get in, get out. What we want to do is to create an environment across all of our channels that actually starts to capture customers further up the decision tree. So much more when you are thinking about something that you might want to do, a mission that you have to solve, how do we make ourselves more relevant for you? How do we encourage you to play? How do we encourage you to test and trial? How do we encourage you to engage with a colleague? And if you started that journey online, how do we get you into the store? Because that's actually what we need to do. So, discover and dwell, range and speed, create theatre. If you think about technology environments, the technology landscape at the moment, the reference point for most customers is high theatre. High theatre, lots of engagement, lots of spaces where you test and play products, even if you're not actually in the, in the process of purchasing that day. Second one was hero brands. If you think about the appreciator segment, they're not into technology for what it can, do, uh, for what it does. It's kind of what it delivers to you. What they need are lots of signals that they're in the right place, highlighted again across all of the journey. So hero brands, very visible space to breathe, try play, and more importantly, support services. Once we put that brief together, we then started to think about what's the role of digital in these stores? How do we start to bring this to life, recognizing that customers are likely to be bouncing through those channels? We then started to think about access, so empower. How do you bring click and collect to life? What are the purchase options? Um, access, inspire, interactive displays, etc. So very clear on what we wanted digital within that overall brief to actually deliver for us. The critical thing, I guess, for us here, and what's been very different for me working in Maplin, is that this journey has started store out. I come from a background where most of the, the digital development that I has, I've done has certainly been on a device that is often this big, where you're trying to design from a, something that's the size of your thumbnail. What we're trying to do is to kind of make the, the experience particularly rich in a store and then work out what are all the touch points that customers would then work back from or into um, based on where they are in their journey. So. This kind of bubble graph up here is a high-level representation of what our store format looked like. What you probably won't be able to read around the, si uh, around the outside is that, that we created lots of new zones. So categories that already existed for customers sitting around the perimeter, but sitting in the middle, locked into the heart of our proposition, is smart, smart home. 
Once we'd done that, we then started to think about where in the journey, what are all the touch points where we need digital to start to bring things to life for customers. So we worked on that and we, we started off on the perimeters because we thought actually those are categories that are known, home entertainment, gaming for example, home, you know, networking, where there's lots of rich content, customers are likely to be fairly well informed, how do we bring that journey to life through those touch points? And then we got into smart, we got into the middle of the store. And that's the point at which we kind of thought, do you know what, this for us is a game changer. And we started to work through the journey. We started right at the very beginning saying, how does digital disrupt us? How do we kind of set up what smart life is to start with? And smart life in itself was a very, very conscious decision in terms of terminology. We then thought, once we've kind of hooked you into this whole what is smart life concept, we need to start to get you in front of some product. So we then thought, what does digital do in terms of encouraging you to play, touch, feel product? Take away some of the, think about the whole kind of VHS, Betamax conversation. You know, how do you know, for those of you who can remember it, how do you know that you're going to make the right decision? Which is the first thing that you should buy and then what does it work with? So the first thing was to get you to product. We then thought, once you've got to product, how do you then start to understand the ecosphere, the environment in which this, this kind of new explosion of technology is starting to work? So we then started to think about play tables. And we started to put in mobile devices. We put in if this, then that principles. We started to allow you to be able to, you as a customer, to start to be able to connect all of this stuff together. The thinking at this point is obviously that we then extract it back out into uh, e-commerce and m-commerce channels so that if you've started your journey already outside of the store, when you come in, it feels familiar. That helped us then define what do, what do we need those, those content missions to look like? What does plug and play look like versus what's the role of a connected colleague? And the great thing about our stores is our colleagues are naturally multi-channel. For them, being us, an average store holds about eight, 10,000 SKUs. We stock 40. So for them, being able to kind of access that extended range, happily using the web in store to shop is kind of part of their everyday lives. What they wanted to do, though, was have more information to be able to kind of engage the customer at that specific point in their purchase journey. That helped us therefore think about when is the content experience active and when is it passive? And when is it mission-led versus when is it product-led? And actually, we started off very much in the mission-led space. We've had some learnings about when it needs to be product and we've made some changes, which I'll talk about in a little while. But you can see where we started then to think about defining active and passive spaces. Content. So then we got into what do people actually, if, what, would, what would be the disruptive thing that would get you to stop in a store and start to want to engage with this stuff? So we conducted some research. Most people don't understand connected home or smart home. If you ask them what they think connected home, they talk about the fact that people sit together, they eat together, there's lots of people in a household. They haven't yet, they grasped the concept of smart, but haven't really pulled it together yet in a living context. Things that people talked about being as being really important to them were health, family, home, security, and unsurprisingly, the ability to save money. So we then spent time thinking about how would we build those journeys and how would we then attach the product to try and help you understand what are the, what are the benefits for me? Why should I even engage in this content in the first place? That then led us to start to create what we called play options. So these play options are absolutely customer research led. They're based on missions. You can see in them, they're financial, they're health, they're save me money, they look after my children, they're let me take a delivery when somebody isn't around, how do I keep an eye on my house, how do I make sure stuff is safe when I go on holiday. We've started to build all of those journeys. We then took all of the if, if then that this, sorry, if that this then uh, principles and proposition and started to work out how do we connect the product together. This meant that all of our content guys had to spend an awful lot of time with our commercial teams and with suppliers actually understanding how does this stuff work and how do you then translate it into a language that's meaningful for customers and how do you make it work in an environment that has to go on mobile has to go on tablet, has to go on a digital format in a store, has to go in a catalog, has to go on paper, has to go on print. We really started to think about what all of those content journeys look like. 
So, challenges. We had loads. Um, <laughs> Big one being time, time frame, our whole store of the future proposition. So Cambridge Beehive, which is the, the pictures of the store I put up, up um, right at the very beginning, from kind of a twinkle in somebody's eye, if you like, all the way through to us opening. We did the whole thing in five months. The digital part of it, we did in eight weeks. We had to build five applications in eight weeks, and we had to build all of that content from scratch, map out all of those journeys. Um, so challenges we had, time, obviously. And the key one, I would say, is, I, is kind of really identify your supportable landscape. I suspect most of you, if you are working in a kind of a, a clicks-to-bricks business, will have an awful lot of legacy infrastructure that will make life very difficult for you, certainly made life very difficult for us. So we identified suppliers who were willing to work with us, starting concept store out, and then we'd worry about how we plugged it into the back afterwards. And, you know, we worked with people like Ampliant, Sign Sticks, um, uh, lost the others I where we work with, Sign Sticks, Fuse Pump, uh, and Tab were great people in terms of helping us to really kind of accelerate this program through. The other thing we thought about was, given that it's a proof of concept, rather than trying to go and build lots of stuff ourselves, what can we buy? What can we go and kind of talk to people about and say, we're on this journey, how quickly can you come on it with us? And the great thing was with some of those partners was that they accelerated their own development roadmaps in order to get some of this stuff live, mainly, I think, because they couldn't believe that we would do it, and also because a lot of them talked about the fact that people have very big digital content aspirations in a store format, but getting them live is a real challenge. Um, we said we would accept a whole bunch of manual processes. It doesn't all have to be perfect. Let's not assume that it does. And we worked, spent a lot of time working out what a minimum viable product would be. You know, there are lots of things we would have liked to do on day one. We accepted that we couldn't do them. Therefore, we spent an awful lot of time de-scoping stuff, and we've worked out a journey. We kind of accepted this was going to be the sandbox, so therefore, we'd come back. We'd learn, we'd keep testing, we'd come back, and we'd put more in. So... What does it look like? So this is the store now. This is kind of the front of our store. This is what the inside starts to look like. You can see how we've started to bring smart home to life. We've actually connected li live devices into the store. So that's Alexa. Um, Google Home will also go in this week, but that's Alexa. Amazon gave us Alexa to put into two stores. This was the first one. We put it into one store in London. Of the back of the success of Cambridge, we now have Alexa in all of our stores. We weren't a partner for them before this. We've connected Alexa to everything. She turns on the store lights, she turns on the radio, she turns on all sorts of stuff, and customers can play with it as much as they want to, as well as utilizing the devices that actually sit within the store. You can see that we've put a lot of time and effort into, into, into effectively what I would have historically called wallpaper. So we've put a lot of pause in to really encourage customers to play, touch, feel. And we've also spent a lot of time making sure that the experience is completely uniform. So no matter which device you go to throughout the store, the engagements and the interactions are all the same. So there is a familiarity that therefore gives customers more confidence, and colleagues actually, more confidence to be able to play with the devices. And this is the play table. So this is where we have put in the, the kind of if this, then that principal play table, connecting all of the devices together and bringing the ecosphere. We put in mobile devices with all of the applications on. You can plug your own in if you want to. And we've then put in a whole network of devices. So you can see how easy it is to turn the Nest thermometer on and off. You can play with Alexa. You can ask her to do all sorts of things. You can use the, the Ring doorbell. You can use the Yale smart key. You can do all, basically, the idea is to kind of give you lots of confidence in, in playing and utilizing this stuff. But digital is the key to us being able to deliver all of this. Our gaming pod, so again, you know, lots of opportunities for people to play. An extended range. As I said to you, we've got about 40,000 SKUs, only 8,000 of which can be stocked in. We've allowed customers and colleagues to be able to see more. We've curated it by zone and by department, so you don't have to navigate your way through 40,000 to make that really simple and transactional for customers. So how's it doing? So Cambridge, dwell time has significantly increased, doubled actually. 
Uh, the number of Bayes Browns has gone from an average six to nine. And interestingly, we are seeing a very, very different customer base in the stores. More families, more females, more people who are comfortable and confident. People just coming in who didn't know we've been on that site for a long time, didn't realize we were there, being attracted to come in and play with some of the devices that sit in there. You can see the split between discover and dwell and find and get. Before we changed this store, 80% of people who came to the doors were on a find and get mission. CSAT, we didn't think we'd beat 90, actually. Kind of 90 in terms of customer satisfaction is gold standard. This store runs at 93. And the really important thing, given how many people will put digital devices into stores and then they don't get used, is we've had over 20,000 digital interactions in four months. So people are very willing to engage and play and test and try this stuff if it's in an environment in which they feel comfortable and there's a real benefit. We're also now working out how do we roll this back out across the channels. So if part of doing this, we had to put a dam in. We didn't have a dam. We don't have a, con a, we don't have a working content management system. We don't have a PIM. So we've put all of the stuff into Cambridge, and we're now plugging it out backwards. And that's allowing us, therefore, to be able to use that content and that technology to accelerate publications and content across other channels. So we're back rolling it into the web. We're back rolling it into digital. We're just producing a catalog out of the dam. Um, lots and lots of stuff that we're now being able to connect the journey more seamlessly for customers. We're also then looking at how do we accelerate it across channels. So the store of the future co uh, format, which you've just seen, we're currently in the process of turning seven more stores on, the first one of which goes live this week. But given the success that we are seeing off the back of the store, and we're seeing double-digit sales growth like for like, and we're seeing double-digit sales growth in terms of the control group, we're also seeing triple-digit growth from Smart Home, and that's on top of triple-digit on the rest of the estate. Key question to us was how do we get this out more quickly? How do we get this interaction and engagement to go? So we're working on a format, a play table format, that we can roll into the majority of the estate before the summer this year. And we've taken lots of learnings. We've done three rounds of research in the back of this store since it launched, working with customers to find out what works and what doesn't work, and what engagement have they had in, in digital channels before they hit the stores to help us inform some of those decisions. So to conclude, I guess key things I would say is we spent a lot of time, particularly on the back of our legacy systems, which, you know, are like lots of legacy systems have a long way to go in terms of being kind of fit for purpose for a digital business. We spent a lot of time asking ourselves, not, not why can't we do something, but how do we do it? What are the ways around it? And then how do we retrofit it back into the rest of the estate? We absolutely recognize that this is a proof of concept. It was okay to fail. And genuinely, it was OK to fail. It was one store, one store, one small set of suppliers, one digit, one omnichannel proposition, if you like, that if it didn't work, it didn't matter. We'd learn from it, and we'd kind of roll it elsewhere. Um, for us, I would say key thing is store out. So we've really made the heart of the omnichannel journey, if you like, from here. Because fundamentally, we recognize this is a customer base who need advice, want to talk to people, and a technology revolution that's so early in its curve that in that facial, you know, that interaction with customers is really important. So store out in terms of the journey important for us. Colleague engagement is critical. Stores love it. They absolutely, you know, the colleagues, uh, yeah, stores, colleagues love it. All of them will ask when they, you know, the next ones to kind of be on the journey with us. We've given them, all of them, devices in the store. That means that they feel more comfortable, easy to have those kind of conversations with customers. Their product knowledge is, you know, obviously increasing all the time because it's there at their fingertips. Um, and the other thing that I never thought I would say is it's okay to put quite a lot of wallpaper in. I think a lot of point of sale that ends up in stores is exactly that. But actually, customers really need that signposting, that reassurance that it's okay to go touch, play, and what do things do? And don't assume that the first place that they'll go to is the screen to learn about it. You know, a bit of paper with some, some printed words on often works kind of just as well. So in summary, that's my, my kind of my journey, if you like, in terms of where are we on our omnichannel. I say right at the very beginning of our journey for us. Really, really positive experience that we've had through this um, and lots more to come. Thank you very much for listening.
Wow, well, I'm, I'm blown away by that. I can't believe you actually came here and shared it with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I was scribbling away. Lots of great ideas. Before I come to you guys for questions, because we're going to have time for at least one, if not a couple, I wanted to just clarify, you mentioned several three-letter abbreviations in there. There was PIM, DAM, and CMS. Right, OK. Just in case anyone's wondering what those are, could you quickly... Well, I'm, sh I'm sure they're not, but um, <laughs> if they are, obviously, our product information management system, we don't really have a properly functioning one of those, although it's just about to go in. We don't have a digital... We didn't have a digital asset management system, a properly functioning one across all the channels, but we have one now, and a content management system, which we plugged in, actually, on to, to get this particular thing live, uh, and we're now rolling it back out across the, the rest of the channels. Awesome, thank you. Now, does anybody have any questions? Oh, wow, two hands up. Uh, if we go to the gentleman at the back then, then we'll come to the, the gentleman nearer to the front. Yeah, hi, thanks very much for that. And um, I think it's absolutely brilliant innovation in store. How have you found that relating to online sales? Have you found it drives traffic to the websites and vice versa, or how do the two um, interplay? So, uh, actually, well, so the one thing I didn't talk about, which is connected into this but isn't yet live, is we've also been building a single view of customer. So that's just literally just gone live, which will allow us through the stores then to start to capture those that you know that customer information, and then we'll be able to track the journeys between the two. So. 18 months ago, digital was about 12% of, home delivery was about 12% of our sales. It's now, as I say, 17, home, home delivery is now 17. So it's growing. Whether or not it's connected to this, really hard to say at the moment. But once we get single customer view in and we can start to see a little bit more interaction between the, the channels, I'd like to say yes. Who knows, maybe I can come back next year and tell you. Excellent. And the second question there? Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I thought that was uh, really insightful, a great story to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it sounded like uh, I got a sense of a lot of urgency. First of all, what was the rush? And, and secondly, what did you uh, learn about consumer behavior on, on the way? Okay, so what was the rush? Um, retailer, <laughs> want to make money quite quickly. Uh, two things, I guess, really. We're privately, we're PE backed. So there's a timetable. There is obviously an agenda at which these guys want to do things. But the more important thing actually was, was us realizing and actually having faith in how big we think the connected home market is going to be. And the fact that it's almost a pivotal point in terms of who our customer is going to go to and feeling that we are, you know, we are absolutely the right people to be at the forefront of that, that kind of agenda and that revolution. You know. Nobody, in all the research that we did, no other technology retailer has the degree of trust and credibility that Maplin certainly had. And therefore, for us, it was very, very important that we kind of got this thing going quite quickly. Um, in terms of customer insight, I think it's really interesting, actually. So the one thing we have learned is that the time scale between you tending to buy your first connected home product to you buying your second is about six weeks. Um, seen that back kind of through the stores. Um, we've certainly seen that we, we went very clean to start with, so we didn't put an awful lot of content into the stores. We assumed really if we put some great product out and we put some digital devices out and said, touch me, people would but they don't. Um, and actually what they need is lots and lots and lots of encouragement to do that, which is why I said to you, don't be afraid to stick the wallpaper in because what you think is wallpaper actually isn't. And since we have gone and reformatted again with more print in the store, actually customers' confidence to come and play has, has definitely grown. Um, and the other thing I guess I would say is it's definitely a gender-neutral environment now um, versus it was you know, very much kind of a male arc rights sort of environment before so I guess they're the key and the how just how quickly it is changing you know as I say we we keep going back in we keep testing we keep playing of the seven stores that we're just about to put live we've got five different variants going into those stores because we're learning stuff as we go through about how people want to engage I think once we get the content management system live and we get the CMS live oh sorry CMS live and the single customer view live that's when we'll then be able to really kind of work our way backwards into some of the more digital you know the outside digital channels rather than the, the ones that sit in the store. Okay, brilliant. Siobhan, thank you okay. so much. That's Great. been absolutely thank you very brilliant. Much, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.